What I wanted to highlight is a phenomenon in, in Muslim culture that's actually a really, uh, it, it's, it's a threat to our faith. It's a threat to our relationship with Allah Himself. One of the most fundamental components of my relationship and your relationship with Allah is that He is our protector. That he, he protects us. Nothing else, no one else can protect us when Allah protects us. And nothing else can save us when Allah wants some harm coming our way. We say to, we declare, nothing will strike us except for what Allah has decreed or written for us. And it's interesting in that ayah, we didn't even say what He has written against us. We said what He has written for us. In other words, even a bad experience is going to have some good in it, whether we get it or not. But we're going to attribute good to Allah. إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا هُوَ مَوْلَانَا He's the one that's protecting us, guarding us, securing us. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And Allah alone, believers should be placing their trust. So what is this threat that I'm talking about that can undercut our entire faith? What happens a lot of times in other religions, let's not talk about Islam for a second. In other religions, when somebody gets into trouble, they grab on an amulet. They grab on a crucifix, or they grab on a, a, you know, some kind of a, a charm, some kind of a thing. And they say, well, this thing protects me. This ring that I'm wearing protects me. This, this, this band that I have around my wrist, it protects me. This locket that I have protects me. Or this, this book that I've put in my dashboard protects me. You understand? Or if I go and I do I sprinkle this kind of water on myself, that special water is going to protect me. There's physical things in other religions, physical things that people start attributing, they have supernatural protective powers. And if I have those things, then I'll be protected somehow. Now some of that made its way into even Muslim thinking. That we started believing in objects that have special powers. Which is why you find people go to Umrah and they go to Hajj and they, they sneak in a pair of scissors. And when they get to the Kaaba, they'll cut out a little bit of the cloth and bring it home. And every time they get, you know, sinus infection, you know, rub it on their forehead because it's going to get rid of all their problems. Now they're believing that because this cloth was touching the Kaaba, that somehow this cloth has supernatural powers and it's going to heal them. The thing is, now you're looking at protection from things and you're starting to lose your connection from the idea that Allah Himself is the one who protects. Then a lot of times people start believing in you know harm that can come to them from the unseen and there's an obsessive compulsive tendency among many Muslims, sometimes educated Muslims, well-learned Muslims to believe if something is wrong with me, if I lost my job, if I'm going through depression, if I'm having trouble in my marriage, if I'm having, if I got diagnosed with a disease, if this happened, this problem happened, that problem, somebody did magic to me. I need to find out who did magic to me. And if, the, if they did magic, I need to find, if they did some spell, I need to go to someone who's going to find me the, you know, the prescription to undo that spell. And this happens in other religions all the time. But this kind of ignorant thinking has made its way into our religion, where people have started believing that they can go to certain people who will make them prescriptions, literally, hey, I'm going to write this word on this piece of paper, you fold it up, and you swallow it, don't ask questions, or dip it into your orange juice and then drink it, let the ink go in, and then drink it, and that's it, you will find your lost motorcycle. It's gonna come back to you, it's gonna drive on its own, it's gonna be on your you know, driveway before you know it. And what's even crazier, is a lot of times the people who make these kinds of prescriptions, they'll put ayat of the Qur'an, words from Allah's words. And so the, 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 the one who doesn't understand the purpose of the Qur'an thinks, well it has Qur'an on it, it must have special powers. It has Allah's name on it, so this must be a good thing. Let's take a step back for a moment. And by the way, the counter argument when you question something like that, for your, and I'm not saying you go and start these fights at home. That's not what I'm saying. I want you to understand why this is, a, this is problematic, not because it's ignorant or evil or wrong. I'm saying why, this is, why is this problematic? It's taking you away from Allah. You're not realizing it's taking you away from Allah. That's the biggest harm. That's the biggest harm of all. The thing is, when you start believing in these kinds of prescriptions, there's a really deep problem in the way you think about your faith and the way you think and I think about Allah. 
You see, Allah told us, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُطْلِعَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ Listen to this carefully now. Allah will never tell you what's happening in the unseen. When is Judgment Day coming? I don't know. Where are the jinn and what are they doing? I don't know. Allah did not give us access to the unseen. He didn't. He gave that access in a limited way in what He wanted to His messengers والسلام, But when you go to somebody and say, hey, I'm having a lot of trouble in you know, my marriage, or I'm having a lot of trouble with anxiety, I'm having trouble sleeping, or I can't concentrate in my prayer. And they say to you, hold on a second, let me, let me, let me access the unseen. And according to the unseen, if you read this 37 times, and then do the hokey pokey and turn around in 360 degrees a few times, then sit on this couch and then on that couch, and then jump up and down, and do this for 45 days, then you'll be fine. Or some lady goes to some, the people go to these places, I can't have children. Or I only want sons. Another kind of ignorance. I only want sons. How can I make sure I have sons? Okay, I'm going to write something down on this. And he literally, he could be writing the alphabet. He could be whatever it may be. And he'll fold it up and put it on your arm. Don't take it off. If you take it off, you won't have a baby. And once you have a baby, never take it off. The moment you take it off, baby's going to die. And you have women whose sons are 30 years old and they're wearing this thing. Muslim. Believing this is somehow protecting their child. For Muslims that are supposed to be knowledgeable in their deen, knowledgeable in the word of Allah, they'll say things like, you know, my son, or my daughter, or my whoever, they're not responding to me. Some, their wife must have done magic on them. She's putting magic in their food. And now they've changed. It may have nothing to do with the fact that you were abusive. It may have nothing to do with the fact that you insulted someone. It must be magic. And now all of a sudden, your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law, your nephew, or your niece, they're sorcerers. They're like the Sahara of Firaun's time. And you got to stay away from them. If they, if they give you food, it might be poisoned. They may have blown something on it. And then when you eat that food, that's it, you're going to get cancer. This belief that somehow someone else other than you, a human being, has access to the unseen and can cause you harm. They can cause you harm. Is you contradicting the fundamental belief that your protector is Allah. And no one can harm you unless Allah wills that to, to be the case. And let's even for a moment, even though my khutbah is not about magic, but let's talk about that for just a second. The Arabic word sihr, actually has to do with manipulating someone's thoughts. It has nothing to do with someone hovering in the air. Quran says when the magicians did magic against Musa salam, it was made to appear to people. Their thoughts were manipulated. The idea of magic is to actually influence somebody's thoughts. And there is no greater protection for the thought of a human being than the word of Allah. Which is why the word of Allah did not come to be memorized, even though we memorize it. The word of Allah did not come, so you take one word from it and you read it a thousand times. That's not why the word of Allah came. Allah did not say, Afala tahfadun, Afala turajiun. He said, Afala ta'qidun. Why don't you think? Why don't you, don't you, don't you then think? Don't you then think? The word of Allah came so we can think about the word of Allah. But you know what we've, we've done? We've committed this crime. Like other religions may do this with anecdotes and other kinds of trinkets and things. We've done this with Quran and we've turned the Quran into something we don't think about. We use it for everything else. Take an ayah, fold it up, swallow it, put it around your neck, put it on your arm, do this or that, have an Allah chain. This is an insult to the word of Allah. The word of Allah came, so we find protection in it. Now listen to this ayah, this, this ayah that I started with. My protector is Allah. What's the rest of this ayah? He says, الكتاب, Allah who sent the book down. What did he connect with his protection? His book. He was even more open in Surah Al-Kahf. He said, وَلَن تَجِدَ مِن دُونِهِ مُلْتَحَدًا You will not find any secure refuge other than Qur'an. When someone's in trouble, they should be running to Allah's book and thinking about what Allah says. Not running to Allah's book and putting it in a shelf somewhere, or mindlessly reciting it, thinking that that's the solution. Or taking beginnings of surahs and making grids on their fridge. Or, or you know, coming up with these crazy prescriptions that somebody claims they know how to, if, if this was actually a prescription that solved your problems, the one who would know it would be the Messenger of Allah Because Allah informs him of, of solutions. 
if our messenger did not give those prescriptions, and then some people are like, well, you know, he did tell us to say, Subhanallah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times. See, he gave us numbers, so we can come up with our own numbers. No, he can, because Allah inspires him. Who inspired you? Where did you get these numbers from? Read this 50 times, read that 75 times, do this 20 times. Where did you come up with these prescriptions? And then he ends the ayah, وَهُوَ يَتَوَلَّ الصَّالِحِينَ and he in fact is the one who continues to offer protection to good people. You want special protection from Allah? You want us, your, all your problems to be dealt with and Allah never to abandon your side? Then all you need to do, all you need to do is hold on to, to Allah's book and don't do messed up things. Don't backbite, don't slander, don't cheat, don't lie, don't hurt people, don't do haram things. Get away from what you know to be evil. You get away from evil stuff and you stay straight, Allah protects. The secret ingredient is not some special potion. The secret ingredient is not some special kind of dhikr that will protect you. You live a good life and protection comes from Allah. 